Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for all of you to come here in this busy f uh, fair days. And uh, I'm s uh, happy to see so many people interested in our topic, which is quality the Chinese way, uh, which is different from other ways. And I have with me three uh, experts uh, and uh, in the sequence how they will give you some brief introduction. Uh, there's Darren Gearing uh, from uh, Shangri-La Hotel Group and we have uh, Mrs. Gu from Kaisa, the biggest European, uh, Chinese European tour operator based in Hamburg. And we have Luis Del Olmo, uh, v VP of uh, Melia Hotel Group. So I think all of you have been working in the Asian market for a long time. So um, um, it's not only me <laughs> being this for such a long time, everybody here, and of course Mrs. Gu being a Chinese since birth. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm sure we will have a very interesting discussion and uh, we have been planning uh, that I will give you a very brief intro into the, into the topic, uh, no more than 10 minutes, and then we will hear from each of you some uh, uh, introductory remarks and then uh, of course uh, we are very, very interested to hear your questions, your comments, your experiences uh, and we will try our best to answer them and I think uh, the expertise of all members of the panel will make sure that there will be some good answers. So if you if you allow me I will, I will just give you a brief intro and you can see uh, here already it's called uh, Trends in China Upon Tourism and Consequences for the Tourism and the, especially today, the hospitality industry. So, uh, I, w I won't give you a lot of figures, just to say, uh, China Upon Tourism is, since 2012, the biggest outbound source market in the world, and we are still running at 18% growth, which is, uh, if you compare to 5% global growth, still uh, high, and the growth rate for the spending is even higher. So it's not only that there are an awful lot of Chinese outbound tourists, they also spend an awful lot of money. So looking at the hospitality industry, I prepared 10 little theses, and I will briefly go through them. The first one is traveling for Chinese people has always been an important part of what they're doing, an important part of their education. So, uh, but this is not concerning outbound tourism. So the most famous uh, traveler you can see on, on, the, on, the, on the post stamp on the left, uh, Xu Xiaoke, so he was traveling in China, but he was not a Marco Polo or he was not an Arab Ibn Battuta. So the Chinese are still learning what does it mean to be an international tourist, to be a tourist outside of your own culture background. The second one, briefly for the background to say, it has been the demand which opened the gates. So China Upland Tourism developed in the last 15 years because the Chinese people wanted to get out of China to see the world with their own eyes. And it took quite a while for the government to accept this. And it's only actually since last year, since we have Mr. Xi Jinping, the new government, that the government is actively supporting Chinese to travel out of China as a part of a soft power approach and as a, as a way to show to the world that China is now rich enough to actually have a lot of outbound tourists going for pleasure and for business around. So, important thing to understand is that Chinese outbound tourism is not about holiday, especially long haul travel, it's not about holiday, it's about investment in your own prestige, your self-esteem, in, in, in learning. Uh, so, even so, the Chinese economy will probably have some problems and uh, some people are saying next year we go down to 2% GDP growth and have a deflation in China. Maybe that's too pessimistic, but certainly the times are over when we had 10% growth rates in China. But this will, my thesis is, this will be uh, not have a big uh, effect on outbound travel because it's not like it might be for Western people to say, oh, I better save some money, I don't go on holidays. If you stop to be traveling internationally, as a Chinese person, your friends will say, well, wow, what's, what's the matter with him? He's, not, he's in financial trouble, maybe don't do business with him, any, him anymore. So it is investment. Think of Chinese visitors as investors in themselves and not, don't think of them as holiday makers. And unfortunately, when we talk about the Chinese tourists, the Chinese tourist is not existing. So when you, many journalists were asking, always asking questions, what is the typical thing about the Chinese tourists? And the answer is, if you ask on this level, you will never understand the market. You have at least 
four groups. You have the package tour people. We all know this caricature groups of uh, first time travelers falling out of the bus, taking a photo, going back and rushing to the next place. They are here, they will continue to be a part of the market, but this is not really where you earn the money from. And we, but we do have more and more self-organized travelers, that's about a third of the market now, uh, who have not much time because they are still working for their money. You don't have much, uh, you don't have a big group of old rich people in China. Chinese rich people are young people. Uh, but they have a lot of experience now and, and they more and more organize travels themselves. So if you want to brag about your travel, you, if you go with a package tour, there's not much bragging power left in that. And of course, we have a lot of business people, we have a lot of officials, uh, and we have a lot of Chinese experts. So a lot of the Chinese coming to your hotel in Europe will not come from China, but they will come from another European country or from, from America, traveling within because they are working here. The Chinese are, are buying up lots of companies. Uh, and you have, of course, a huge amount of Chinese students who come to uh, Western countries to study, and they are traveling a lot. So don't think that necessarily all Chinese customers, all Chinese hotel guests are coming from China at the moment they come to your place. They might have been already a year or several years in the West. So if we say Chinese are investors, in themselves when they travel, then of course it's our job to give them a decent return on investment. So try to, and this is the second point here is, oops, I lost, no, okay, uh, is give them quality from a Chinese point of view. So this is the topic of today's session, quality is a Chinese way, and we will discuss, I think, together what does that mean, what's the difference between quality as it is perceived by Chinese people from uh, being perceived by other people. And just one thing I would say is, face. So Chinese traveling abroad see themselves very much as a Chinese person. And what you do to a Chinese very often is seen as you do to the Chinese person. You do this because this is a Chinese person and not so much because seen as an individual. And so there it will be a, a trend that self-organized travel will grow more and more because from our research we can say that Almost everybody who is anybody in China has been to the Eiffel Tower, has been to the Colosseum, has been to the Brandenburg Gate. So there is a clear uh, trend towards self-organized travel. And we can see this year, last year and this year, the visa issue, which was a, a main reason to go with a, with a tour operator, is diminishing. So we had on Tuesday here in Berlin, the European Travel Commission announcing that next week, uh, on the European scale, on the Schengen scale, there will be a new policy for visa, which will make it easier for, for Chinese fr frequent travelers to come to Schengen land. And you have a number of countries where actually Chinese don't need a visa anymore. Mauritius, Seychelles, Maldives, Thailand, India, many other places. So the, the point that Chinese have to travel in groups because otherwise they don't get a visa, this is something which is going down. And one, this is a domino effect. One, a few destinations do that, the others have to follow. So, specifically talking about hospitality, of course, that's our topic today. There are a lot of existing hotel groups which have some China programs. And we would hear from two groups uh, who, are, who are here what they are doing. So there's a Hilton program called Huan Ying, uh, Interconti is doing something called Hua Lux, Merit is doing, company, doing something uh, Li Yu. And I would say all these programs are at least five years behind the time, five years behind the development of the market. They still look on Chinese people are afraid of number four, which might be true for the, for the mass market, but for the sophisticated travelers, you annoy them by telling them, oh, you're a Chinese, you're afraid of number four. They don't want to be seen as superstitious, superstitious uh, country bumpkins. They don't want to have instant noodles in their room. This is again, they see they will be see themselves to be put in the same bag with this uh, country first time travelers. So they don't want to play mahjong. Uh, that is what we think they would want. They don't want to do shadow boxing. And Hua Lux, for instance, uh, is saying in their, in their promotional video for their China program, Chinese people do not drink alcohol. So therefore we have only tea served. I can tell you from traveling in China for 35 years, yes, they do drink alcohol sometimes quite a lot. Uh, and 
we all have understood Chinese people want to watch Chinese television. So I'm, I'm traveling, as most of us I think here do, a lot and uh, stay in a lot of hotels. And very often you find in hotels, there is a Chinese TV channel, but it's CCTV9, which is the English one, which is exactly the one they do not want to see because they want to see a Chinese language one. So that you keep, sometimes you can see the top managers have said, you have to install a Chinese TV program, but on the local level, they use the one they understand, which is the English one, which is not a good idea. So what we have seen in the last half year is that the, the sales for luxury brands has been dramatically dropping, halved. So all the, the Louis Vuittons and the Pradas and the Rolls Royce and the Maseratis of the, of the world are very much in panic. Uh, why is this happening? Because there is a, a lot of shopping outside of China. Uh, because in China there's an anti conspicuous consumption campaign, but there's also an underlying trend, which is not government policy, which is moving from brand to lifestyle, and of course for hotels, that's very important, and moving from sightseeing to experience. And that means what we all learned about the Chinese outbound market has been true in the past, is not true anymore. So the rules of the game are changing again. Sorry, you have to do more work. So because we see a history of waves, we see still at least 100 million Chinese people waiting to do their first trip, let's say, to Europe to see the Mona Lisa. But we have maybe 50 million Chinese people who have already been traveling several times. And they have stopped just taking off the sites and just going to the most famous brands. And they move to a lifestyle, so they are more interested to see what is fitting my self-image? What is fitting the, the image I want to show to my friends on Sina Vevo and, and, and WeChat? Uh, so what is important, seen important within their specific peer group? And these are the people where you can earn much more money. So this is a group where uh, you have to pay much more attention to. So last point, how to make, uh, how to have happy and profitable Chinese guests. So a few points I put here, and we will discuss this uh, in a minute together. And I'm interested to see what my colleagues here are, are saying to that. So I would say two operators, yes, but direct bookings are getting more and more important. These customers speak English, yes, but still they want to have Chinese language information even they don't need it. And they want to have Chinese breakfast even they don't eat it to show respect to the Chinese culture, to show, yes, we acknowledge China as the number one tourism market in, in the world. Chinese travelers tend to be very interested in the public rooms, in the lounges, in the meeting, in the place where you can meet more than in, in the hotel. So the hotel industry has a tendency to concentrate on the room, but for Chinese tourists it's at least as important to concentrate on the public spaces within the hotel. And a lot of Chinese people don't travel as one person or two person, but they travel in small groups. So give arrangements for five or six people together. Uh, this is what they will be very interested in. These customers have money, but they don't have time. So don't let them wait at the check-in, at the restaurant, whatever. And one of the big chances you have, one of the big opportunities you have, these Chinese customers want to have a lot of things done in a short time. So if you have concierge service, if you help them, to get what they want from you, you can earn extra money from that. So uh, i give you an example. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a, a training for a big uh, hotel group on Mauritius and on Réunion. And they have a lot of honeymoon customers. And they brought a Chinese photographer uh, to Mauritius who is taking photos the Chinese way, with quality the Chinese way, for these honeymooners. And taking photos is a very important part of the honeymoon. So, they charge 2,000 euro, and they get 10% commission. So they get 200 euro for nothing. And the customers, the guests are happy that they have this wonderful service. So it's a, it's a reason to book this hotel, and they get 200 euro for, for not doing anything. So these are the opportunities which are waiting for you if you understand the market uh, like that. So in a nutshell, if you have learned something about the Chinese customers that's very good, it's time to learn more about them. Thank you very much.
Okay, so uh, I think hopefully this gives you some ideas, something to think about while, uh, of course, now we will get some uh, ideas from the practical side, from those who actually do the business, not just talk about it like me. Uh, Darren, please start. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, we currently have 37 hotels in mainland China. Uh, primary cities, secondary cities, and now we're going to some smaller cities, of course, which in China are only four million people. Um, we're very excited, and we've already enjoyed much success with Chinese luxury travelers. Um, in Europe, our hotel in Paris has done extraordinarily well in a very short period of time with very high net worth individuals from China. Um, Maldives, Malaysia, the Philippines, and of course, naturally, Hong Kong, because of the movement across the border there. I believe it's the busiest border in the world, actually. Um, Chinese luxury travelers are always changing. They're changing in their age. They're changing in the reasons for them traveling. And of course, we're very much at the beginning of the trend. Uh, I do believe there's still another 35 new airports to be built in China. Um, quite frankly, I've traveled extensively in China, and seemingly every airport is new to me compared to Europe and North America. Um, they have wonderful airports, and there's more coming, so that means there's going to be more Chinese people coming towards us, um, of which many of them will be high net worth individuals. Um, it's great to see the airlines are uh, increasing flight. British Airways started in September last year to Chengdu. Lufthansa have always had superb networks to Guangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai, etc., etc. So that's really helpful. And of course, you have private jet traffic as well, which is becoming a phenomenon in China. Private jet travel is there to stay, and net jets and the like are doing exceptionally well. Chinese high net worth individuals, um, they normally travel in groups. They of varying ages, and how they buy is changing every single month. <laughs> um, some of them like to book direct, some of them like to book through friends, some of them like to book through C-Trip, some of them like to book through bookings.com. You name it, that's the way they come, and sometimes you will be quite surprised the people who do book through bookings.com, because they may buy your second, third, or even your largest suite in the hotel. They travel with friends, they travel with children, and we're very fortunate because there's several large holiday periods in China. Of course, you have Chinese New Year. To a certain extent, you still have May Day. And of course, you have the national holidays in China, which is October 1 through October 10. And these are huge movements of people. Huge compared to what we are used to here in Europe. How do you cater to these people? First of all, you need to know who they are before they arrive in a hotel. Some people like to be exceptionally discreet, some people don't. And that's about, to a certain extent, bragging rights. But also, there's a lot of knowledge now. And repeat guests to certain cities, Istanbul, Paris, London, it's enormous. People go all the time now. Chinese Mandarin-speaking staff, quite frankly, is a basic minimum requirement. It is nothing special any longer. In all of our hotels in Europe and North America, we have it. It is a minimum standard. In London, we're just about to open on May 6, and we even have a button on the telephone for 24-7 Chinese language service. It's basically a minimum standard. Of course, it looks great, and people talk about it. But if you're Chinese, it's a minimum standard, just like it was in the 70s for the Japanese. Um, Chinese breakfast and having great Chinese food is really also a minimum requirement. We have done exceptionally well in Paris with our Chinese restaurant, Istanbul. Uh, unfortunately, in London, we don't have the space, but London has a huge prevalence of fantastic Chinese restaurants, so we're fine. Um, but having Chinese food is also very, very important. There are a few extra touches that you can do. For example, bespoke tours are very, very important. Most of the people we cater to now, they are traveling in a small group or in a couple. We really don't see many groups at all. 
70, 80, 90% of our business now are individual, tiny group, groups of travelers. They like to have experiences, as Wolfgang said, that are educational. So for example, in the UK, what is very, very interesting is horse racing. Mm. Yes, everybody wants to go to Harrods for two hours, but they love to go to see where the really fine horses are and meet the trainers and have bespoke tours. The level of detail and the level of preparation before somebody arrives is overwhelming amongst those type of travelers. We have people who come to France before they've even arrived. Their private Vintner tour in Bordeaux and Burgundy and Epinay is already arranged because they already have 500 cases of wine in their basement in Beijing. That level of finesse is now, again, becoming quite normal. Mm. We have some extra touches that we do, and we, are pl we do it in Paris, we do it in Istanbul, we're going to do it in London, in North America. We will send someone to the airport to collect the Chinese high net worth individual, a Mandarin speaker who will be there at the gate, because that is a minimum requirement in China. If you have a guest who's flying in, you go to the airport and you meet them. You don't have a driver from an outside company standing there with a piece of paper with their name on it. Sorry, that doesn't work. We will have no less than five or six TV channels. Mm -hmm. We will have welcome tea. And in most of our hotels, we will have no less than 10 to 12 teas available. Fermented tea, green tea, non-fermented tea. It's a normal requirement for a Chinese guest. And the way you serve it, of course, is a particular style. So we have many things up our sleeve in how we deal with them. But the big thing for us at the moment, truly, is distribution in China. How you sell your brand, how you sell your rooms. It is hugely exciting because it's changing all of the time. And I think it's going to change into the foreseeable future. Social media, media is very important. Uh, Dada, Weibo, and all of this, we work with all of these, and bloggers truly do represent your brand for you. You have certain bloggers that have 14 million followers, 15, 16, 25 million followers. These are the sort of numbers that we're talking about. So it's very exciting for us. Uh, fortunately, you know, I think we're well placed with our network in China. Um, the one thing we all need to get very comfortable with dealing with Chinese luxury travelers is that the demands will always change. And, I, and I've kind of thought about this a great deal about why this is happening. And I think if any of you have been to China recently and tried to book a hotel in Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou or Dalian, the reality is now the choice is enormous. Everybody is there. Chinese people are used to walking in brand new, beautiful hotels with 45 square meter rooms. That's what they're used to, because that's what they have at home. So when they come over here, when they go to North America, that's the minimum requirement, okay. because that's what they can get in Beijing and Shanghai. Okay. So I hope I've given you a, a little bit yeah, of a very good. insight on how we view it and how we deal with this. Yeah. So thank uh, you. I, I think yeah, mm. this is very interesting to you, and I, I, I think I can fully agree. The, the only thing which is true is it is changing. It's a permanent change. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm sure, so if you have questions, please keep them in your mind and you, we will have opportunity to, to answer them. But I think uh, we go on uh, and ask uh, Mrs. Gu from Kaisa uh, to give us uh, the authentic view of a young Chinese person. <laughs> uh, and uh, and talk, I think from the experience of the tour operator to talk again about, I think, the differences between the, the, the new Chinese travelers and the mass market travelers, so please. Yes, um, I'm very glad to join this discussion. The la last year, I was just a visitor to meet our partner hotels and uh, uh, improve our relation, uh, working relationship here. But now I'm sitting here with you to talk about the next uh, second wave of Chinese tourism. And um, I'm delighted that the, the a huge amount of Chinese tourism has winged uh, uh, attention uh, from the world. And uh, when I first saw this topic, I just walk, uh, I was busy working 
on the topic uh, on the purchasing plan for 2014. Uh, last year, we, uh, our Kaisa uh, celebrated the uh, 20 years an anniversary and also opened our first London office in Europe and also our office in USA. And that means a huge amount of uh, um, uh, uh, Low budget group will come, but uh, that that there's also a lot of FIT groups will also come. Uh, that means I must uh, contact more uh, international chain hotels, uh, chain hotels, and uh, uh, found more uh, hotels with with their features uh, for our guests. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you said, um, there are more and more independent. Uh, Self-organized tourism come here in European. They are more, uh, they are younger, perhaps 25 or uh, to 40 uh, years old, and uh, they are also uh, they also had uh, studying abroad. They are repeat travelers. Uh, European and also USA will not be uh, foreign foreign lenders for them. They all uh, they also can learn all information from internet, thanks for the social media. Yeah? And uh, that means they, uh, they, they are not afraid of the, uh, the, the, the things, stranger things what they, uh, they don't know. And they want to learn more and more information from local. That means for us, uh, the difference between first wave and the second wave uh, for, for, uh, in the hospitality segment is that the location. First one is the location. Uh, we know uh, in the first wave of uh, Chinese tourism, uh, some, some travel agencies will, uh, would like to cut down the cost and to su survive in the inter uh, intensive competition among other, uh, um, among other uh, travel agencies. They will perhaps organize the hotels uh, quite away from the destination and sometimes also quite away from the cities. But now it doesn't work because all the independent uh, uh, self-organized uh, customers, they can read in the internet and they can also check like booking.com, travel advisor, every information is there. They know where they live, where they stay and they will quite, uh, quite quick, uh, have quite, uh, quickly reflections that if they are staying in a good hotel or not, and they will give us the feedback. It's very important for us. And uh, just uh, professional art has uh, told us that the Chinese guests are much uh, are money rich and time poor. It's still the situation they have now for the young generation. It's still uh, still there, but they will reorganize their timetable to uh, to serve this solution. That is, they won't uh, turn off the uh, bus, the coach, to take just pictures. Uh, Eight country within ten days, and after that they will even don't know, the, uh, don't remember the name of them. Mm -hmm. They will uh, they will go deeper and narrow. Perhaps they just uh, organize the four destinations within ten days, or with just uh, uh, three or five, uh, three or uh, four cities that they really interested in. And I think it's it's the the, the very obviously the a trend. Uh, in our young generation, yes, and uh, they will spend m perhaps m tw uh, tw uh, more money uh, from the accommodation to mm. save more time for the things they re they really interested in. It's very important for us to do the purchasing plan for our new products. Yes, and uh, the classification of our hotel uh, hospitality industry will not. Uh, just uh, depends on the price, uh, the, the international no chance. It also depends on the location, the distance from the city centers, or the also is it convenient for to, to access to the um, public uh, transportation uh, uh, transport terms and also the sightseeing. We will also uh, see uh, see this uh, very important element for us. Yeah. And uh, I think the second uh, second trend is the uh, features of the hotels. You know, uh, in the first wave of uh, tour uh, Chinese tourism, 
uh, perhaps they will uh, concentrate on the details in the hotels, like uh, just like the uh, you, you told, uh, told us that a water corker uh, in in each room, uh, Chinese food uh, in in the restaurant, and also some home-like accommodation will be perhaps the model of some hoteliers, yeah. But I think for the young generation, it will be a plus point for them. Uh, more, more for them important is the features of the hotel. Uh, for example, uh, in we will, uh, we will um, in the, the more inquired uh, hotels will be like ice hotel in Sweden mm. because it's very yeah typical local uh, local um, element in this area and perhaps also many hotels in UK. Yeah, and the design hotels with painting for our theme groups. Uh, that as the feature of the hotels will be uh, very impo important for our self-organized uh, 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 travelers. And uh, I think, yes, um, uh, yeah. And I think the, the third one is the social media. You, uh, you also know uh, internet is everywhere now as we are living in an information exploding euro, yeah? And uh, mm, the, the, the Chinese young people, they, they, can't, they, can't apart from, they cannot uh, live without internet. You may also think perhaps the young people sitting on the same table, but they don't talk m <laughs> very much. <laughs> yeah, actually, they, they, they just work uh, staring at their smartphone and updates and updates to find more in information. It's mm. quite normal now in China. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, and they, they see all the things from Weibo and the, um, the, the Chinese Twitter and uh, also Weixin to get, a, it, it's a big platform for them to exchange information, to share information, to uh, perhaps uh, after travel, they will also post all the pictures on this Weibo or Weixin to, uh, to show their friends that I'm being there, I'm done that. So all the, uh, all the, uh, all the points I just mentioned, the two point lo location and the also local things from the hospitali hospitality were put in his Weibo to show that I've been there, I've, I've done that. The, all, all the local things I, I have experienced. It's very important now for the young people here uh, in, in our generation, yes. So I think for the, um, for the next wave, and also the, for the hospitality industry, a frequent appearance in social media and also in OTA, that will be more important for them. Mm, yes, as, okay. as the things that I think will be very important in the next several years. Okay. Yeah. Wow, thank you very much. So I think these are very, some very good insights uh, to see. Uh, well, I think all we heard from, from there is obviously all true and you have been concentrating on high net worth individuals. So you talk about the young people, and of course you have to keep in mind that a lot of these young people are rich people. So the, the average age of a millionaire in China is 39 years. The average age of a millionaire in, in Germany is 55 years. So, so it's rather the younger people who have more money. But, so I think just one point I thought very interesting, you say uh, location, so where, where is the hotel located in relation to public transport? Because also from our research, we can see even uh, affluent younger Chinese tourists, they ha certainly have enough money to pay for a taxi. Still, they will use the metro to have the experience. So, so therefore, it, location means how many uh, metro stations away from, from the city yes. center, uh, which is something maybe for, for Western tourists is rather thinking in, in, in meters or kilometers, where this is more thinking in public transport. So mm -hmm. I think, and yeah, I think a lot of interesting stuff, and of course, yeah, probably you, you all have seen this uh, scene with Chinese people sitting on the, around the table and everybody's just uploading the next picture. And, and therefore, the hotels have to be a place you can tell something about, you can tell stories about. Yeah. So because that was what your, your friends want to hear. Yeah, what because did you, the hotels... What's your experience? Uh, what, what, what did you... 
What did you do there? What, what is interesting to tell? Yeah, I think in next uh, few years, uh, hotels will not be just uh, a, a simple accommodation to uh, people after a one day travel to stay in. It could also be a speaker or sightseeing for them yes. to uh, a destination. Uh, yeah, yeah, a destination for them that uh, this hotel itself has a, a story to talk. That would Which be also means very more money for <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 okay, so Luis, please. Ni hao to everybody. That's about everything I've learned in Chinese for the last five, four years. <laughs> and that's my fault. Mm -hmm. So I should have spent a little bit more time to it. Um, four years ago, about, I was assigned by the board to reinitiate our presence in the Asia Pacific region. Many of you might not know that the Melia Hotels International basically started its first international hotel in that region. And in, the, in this case, in Bali. Uh, that was our first hotel in the Asia-Pacific region. Since, with our partners, the Indonesian partners that we had at the time, we have further developed primarily in the Southeast Asia region. So we had some knowledge of what we called Asia, but obviously we had no knowledge at all when we opened four years ago our first hotel in Shanghai, in Pudong, about really what the Chinese market was about. Let's stand alone what the Chinese were expecting from a hotel and a luxury hotel company like ours. So anything that Darren said, uh, we didn't know anything about that, you know, which is seemingly basic now about how to relate to the ch Chinese market. We were actually at the starting point of a, a huge learning curve, uh, but we had to go in fast track. So the two areas I was assigned is definitely to develop our portfolio and our presence in the region, and secondly, to basically train the organization at, in a second stage as to how we would have to behave to a market which I don't think in this room we have any doubt is probably going to be the leading outbound traveling market in the world. So, uh, and we were not alone. We were not alone. I mean, we saw the same strategy coming from the Starwoods. We saw the same strategy coming from Hilton, from Intercontinental. Everybody suddenly realized that this goes so fast that in the coming years, either we Chinify our way of operating or we're not going to be in this market at all. So on the first track, we have moved over the four, uh, last years. We moved with a two-prompt approach, i.e., the first outbound market for the Chinese traveler is obviously the visa-friendly uh, destinations, which are close by. And like Darren mentioned, obviously Southeast Asia is one of their first visiting grounds. So that's where we felt comfortable. We were already basically present, and we were learning on how to handle that. But on that side, we have also had to prompt our presence in and strengthen our presence in destinations like Cambodia, like uh, um, Malaysia, like Thailand, um, reinforcing already our position that we had in Indonesia. So our map is moving in that direction. And then the other one is obviously taking Shanghai as a base to grow our map and our presence and our footprint in the Chinese market. Now, that seems easier said than realized. And so therefore, we went out for some major partners to join us in that venture. And we were lucky to be able to strike some strategic alliances with Jinjiang, which is one of the largest hotel companies there. And on the other side, with one of the rising stars in the development world in China, which is Greenland. So with these two partners in hand, we started to learn on how to do business in China and how to create products that were Chinese-oriented. Um, our footprint now is basically much stronger. We've moved from eight hotels to 14 hotels in operations. And we have a pipeline that will direct us towards approximately 30 hotels in some of the major, but primarily the secondary cities in China today. Now, when I say secondary cities, any of these cities are almost bigger than Spain. No, maybe not that much, but it's definitely bigger than Barcelona and Madrid. So like I said, we had to learn and catch up a lot from professional people like our colleagues uh, from Shangri-La and, and the experience they had made over the years. Now, our first standpoint was, is it so much different? You know, when the Spanish traveler goes to China and the difficulties he encounters to basically travel in China, 
as the Chinese coming to Spain and trying to adapt and find their way into you know, the tourism field of Spain. And our conclusion at the end is, very humanly, there's no difference, because it's about culture and it's about language. And the culture englobes a lot of elements. Yeah? It goes from food, from life experiences, from reasons to travel, from buying. So we had to analyze the way a Chinese traveler, business or leisure traveler, or family traveler, or small group traveler, had to, and how we had to adapt in order to respond to that. And the key answers, I think we all know, when we go and put ourselves in the position that you arrive for the first time in Xi'an, you don't speak a word of Chinese. Uh, you know how to get there by plane, but once you get there, what's going to happen to me? How do I get to the hotel? When I get to the hotel, do I get the chance to speak to somebody or have a reference where I can? Now, guess what? In China, they're much more advanced than we are. Because wherever you go, you can read English and you can speak English. So you, you find your way around. And we then made our mea culpa and we said, no, we want the Chinese traveler to come to us. Gosh, we didn't even know, you know, how to say the minimum word of welcome to the hotel, which is the minimum, but then speak about how we convert to them in what the room number is, which floor they are in, what the services are, what food we had prepared for them, uh, what other services. So key to us was adapt everything we had in our communication to a customer to the need of the Chinese traveler. And going through that, we had a big help from our Jingjiang colleagues, where we did kind of a marketing alliance, and we both kind of said, OK, let's help each other. You help me in basically receiving the Spanish customer in some of the key destinations in China, and we will help the Chinese traveler to uh, be welcome in our London, Paris, Madrid, Barcelona, and so on hotels. And that was a tremendous learning curve. Uh, and today, it is helping us to better occupancies in the hotel, uh, better guest uh, response, uh, and obviously getting more frequent travelers uh, that is, are coming uh, from uh, the Chinese market. Okay. So all in all, uh, it's taken the company over the last three, four years to reinvent itself and to adapt itself to a market which we now have decided that there's much more to be done. Um, so on the strategic side, coming back to how the market buys, we have obviously had to translate. I think there's been a session of uh, distribution just before this one, uh, which seems simple to us. You know, it's like we go to Germany, England, and France, and we install these systems, and they all speak the language, and they all convert, and they convert the, the, uh, the currencies and all what we want. We start the next day in China, and we say, oh, well, they'll understand English. Well, they don't. Uh, the names are written the same way. No, they don't. Now, how do you take a Chinese name and make it look English when it arrives here? Well, very, very difficult. So, uh, there's a lot to be learned, but it's a very important market for all of us. I thank think the time much. is kind oh, of pressing. Thank you very much for, yeah. for this insight. And, and you can see, it's, it's uh, interesting to hear from a group which is basically moving from Asia with the customers to other destinations and a group moving from essentially Spain and, and, and the West into China. And we, I think it's very clear you see also the different uh, emphasis as you're, you're putting. So, and, uh, so before we open the floor, maybe if you allow me just to, to ask Mrs. Gu, so listening to this different thing. So uh, whereas you have been basically saying the Chinese come and they want quality the Chinese way. They want to get the same they get in China, they get here. They do not want to adapt. Whereas you are saying, well, we want to adapt when we go to China. They want to adapt when they come here. Where well, you say, no, they don't want to adapt. They want to get what they what they want. So this is two very different ideas, uh, two very different. That's a very different perspectives on on the Chinese uh, uh, travelers. So maybe I can ask Mrs. Gu, uh, what is your reaction to these two different points of view? What would you think, for which kind of groups of of travelers, which which of these perspectives are more? Uh, focusing on the important stuff? I think 
uh, in a word, it's a combination. <laughs> it would be better. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, in the uh, I think the in China, the, uh, the travel service is very, I can say, perfect. Uh, they, they consider all the things they can, they, they, they offer all the services they can offer to the to uh, tourism. They, yeah, yes. And uh, all the things uh, for, for foreigners, the foreign language, uh, for the, uh, mm, for the, for the, um, for the uh, European, they also think about that. But I think uh, in the recent years, we also got uh, get these uh, uh, some hotels in European and also in uh, sightseeing in European. They also pay attention uh, as that. Uh, perhaps in Paris and also in some outlets, we also see some Chinese words uh, here, so they can solve these uh, language problems. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime, I think. Uh, especially in my generation, uh, they also want to the local things. Yeah, they, they, um, they, uh, uh, besides the, 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 culture, uh, the culture shock, they also want to get local things, what they really can only can experience in this area. That will yeah. be important yeah. for them. Yeah. Okay, so I think a combination will be ba think, better. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. So I think with this, uh, we can open the floor. And so I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so feel free to ask. So who wants to be first? The gentleman in the back. Wait, do we have a microphone? Okay, wait, stand up. Please tell us who you are. My name is uh, Macy Marvel. I represent Lausanne Hospitality Consulting in Geneva. Aren't, aren't the statistics for outbound travel from China substantially exaggerated by the fact that the SARs are, are treated as, as outbound destinations? Hmm. Well, short answer, if I may say, yes, they are. I mean, I but, mean what, what proportion? But, but as uh, the, so, the Chinese so tourists, tourists spend much more money per day per person than other tourists are, this bias in the wrong direction goes partly back into the right direction. So it is the biggest up on tourism market in the world in terms of spending, and there's no doubt about that. Even if you take out the SARs? Yes. Yeah, it's still big. So that I doubt. Please. Are oh, the gentlemen here? Okay, yeah, please use the mic. Yes. So, so tell us your name, please. Yeah. My, way my name is Sigurd Gravenmeier, Kober Industrial Service in Frankfurt, Nihau. Um, danke schön für diesen uh, wunderbaren uh, Vortrag. Thank you so much for this intriguing presentation. I would like, just like to make a short statement concerning quality. We are also a tour operator. We are very much Chinese driven. Last year in Berlin, we had a five star hotel with 17 rooms worth 45,000 euros, but the deal didn't turn out. A five-star hotel was not able to understand that you have to have a water cooker in your room if you're a Chinese tourist. And this is why another competitor received the contract. I also support very much what Mrs. Gu has said. We need to change our minds in order to understand the Asian parts of their thinking. Sure. OK. Thank you for this statement. Uh, I don't know if, you, if they want to have an immediate reaction to that. If, if not, we, uh, we can move on to another question. I think the gentleman, yes, please. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Long, and uh, I'm working for a Chinese um, internet booking portal uh, specialized in B&B, uh, &B, the bed and breakfast. And uh, um, I totally agree, I missed uh, uh, the uh, you, yeah, Goose. Mr. Goose, <laughs> opinion that uh, the more and more Chinese people um, are willing to have a local life. Um, so, um, it's um, I have three question, questions, and I, um, the, I would like to. Uh, f uh, at first, I would like to know um, how is um, how is the BNB um, and this okay. business uh, running um, now in Europe. And uh, how many, and uh, uh, maybe the, the question two, how many Chinese uh, to tourists have chosen this, uh, have chosen the B&B as their uh, as accommodation? And uh, 
and the question three, um, as a booking portal, how can we approach um, the, the owners of BNB? Thank you very much. Okay, mm. so that's an interesting point, but in breakfast, and I think this is, so I don't know how much you can answer that, but I think often the question is, for, do you see this as a threat? Is this something which you see can eat into your business? And the, I think certainly there's this is trend to go bed and breakfast as going local, going into the culture, immersion is existing. So what would you say, how do you react to that? I, I can only give you a, an opinion, having been back in Europe for two years out of the last 26. Huh? Um, I think I think everybody wants authentic experiences now globally. All travellers want authentic experiences. Uh, when I look at what I said earlier about wineries, specialty experiences that I know some of our guests are demanding now in Europe, I can safely say to you that you're in a very good place and I think there will be a lot of people who actively sink out authentic experiences through bed and breakfasts, chateaus, private houses, and you know, being in the UK, particularly where education is one of our largest exports, sure. and we have our public schools in many more remote areas of the country, they're not all around London and Edinburgh, I am certain those smaller hotels must have seen a huge growth, yeah. uh, especially in the areas of Oxford and Cambridge, which are overwhelmed with Chinese students at the moment, which is wonderful. So uh, I think you're on the good tangent and you should continue. Okay, uh, and they're certainly not a place that we can put a 200 bedroom hotel, so good luck to you too. Mm. Louis, Louis, so yeah, this take? reinforces something that we discussed. I think, again, this market is growing so fast and the way of experiences are growing so f are as versatile as any world traveler, yeah? And so the segmentation is, is huge now. And I can see a lot of demand in that direction. Uh, the same I can see a lot of demand from young people going to five-star hotels in the center of Paris, yes. yeah? And having one single uh, point in mind, in the case of London to go, or Paris to go shopping, because part of that is gonna pay their trip back. Yeah, just by the mere fact of the savings they could do. But more than so, I see people coming in Madrid and Barcelona, and the first thing they want is to go and see soccer in Real Madrid or soccer in Barcelona. So sure. their way of behavior is almost like we would do when we travel anywhere in the world. So that's how fast it yeah. goes. Okay, very interesting. So maybe one last question, maybe the lady here. Let's, let's listen to the Chinese voices. Hi, hello, I'm the Sylvie Chen from China Contact. And I have the question because uh, so far for Shangri-La and the Melia Hotel, you're mostly like a five-star hotel. But for most of the people here, they might represent a like four-star hotel. And most of the big group, they stay in the four-star hotel. So I would like to ask what kind of suggestion you will give to those hotels? Because sometimes they want to keep the hotel quality, so they don't really like a big group or they worry about, like, especially for the breakfast time. Hmm. They will separate the group with the FIT client, especially in four-star hotel. Because yeah. five-star, it's all like a smaller group or like couple, so they won't have this kind of um, problem. Yeah. But for the four-star, they might have this kind of problem. So what kind of suggestion you will give to those hotels? In my case, and we do have four-star hotels, obviously, we have a brand that responds to that. And again, our aim in those destinations where we have perceived Chinese travel and group travel is obviously reinforce the buffet breakfast style in order to make sure to be able to respond like we do to any occupancy of the hotel, which is not possible in all the hotels. So we haven't introduced the enlarged Chinese breakfast facility, but that's something that we probably will have to do. The more we see four-star travelers coming in group to some of our hotels, so to just the extent okay. the, the breakfast facilities and the food and beverage facilities to adapt. Yeah. Thank you. Darren, do you want to take that? Yeah, we, we have the Traders Hotels, which are our four-star brand, of which we have about 13 of them. Um, for the most part, they don't do many Chinese groups uh, because the rates, I'm happy to say, are above the threshold. Uh, but when we do, uh, you know, in places like Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, and in the Middle East, actually. The Middle East is very successful for us at certain times of the year. Um, you know, um, we want that business. 
So we're very happy to take that business. Uh, we try not to take too big a groups uh, because you know it could be overwhelming. And by the way, it's not only about Chinese, it's any other nationality as well. We try not to do that because you don't want to depend on one feeder market. Yes. Because you know we're a hotel, it's got a global offering. But I think for the most part it works quite well. Okay. So last word goes to Mrs. Gu. <laughs> Mm, yeah, actually, the question from this lady is also the question from me, yeah. because the, during the purchasing season, that we also uh, contact with some hotels. They told me very clearly that we are hotels and we don't, we are first stars and we are glad to do your business, Chinese business, but sometimes it's the biggest tool big, uh, the group is too big, that they are not fit for, uh, perhaps the break, uh, breakfast room are not, uh, that um, don't have enough space for them. And uh, sometimes, yeah, but the location, the also the, 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 the features of the hotels uh, uh, point us as purchasing uh, colleagues to purchasing these kind of hotels. That's always the conflict for, for us. Actually, it's also the question that I want to ask the hospitality industry if they can solve this problem. Yes. Okay, so it's an ongoing discussion. And I yeah. think from these answers, you can clearly see there are different markets, and there is a market for high net worth individuals for five star, there is a market for four star, there is a market for bed and breakfast. So the, the, there are Chinese demand niches, and in China, niches are big, uh, in, in every part of the market. And it, certainly, we all will do part of our business with this market and this share will grow. And so I think you did the right thing to come here and listen to these experts. Thank you all very much. Have a successful fair. Thank you very much. Thank you for you. Thank you.